Uh, my name's Lonnie Johnson. Um, I am an inventor. I um, uh, invent um, products, a wide range of products, everything from toys to advanced technology batteries and even um, energy conversion systems. I have a new engine that I've developed that um, I'm very excited about. I was working on the engine with um, some professors at Georgia Tech and one of the professors had a friend who was in, bat in had a battery business and they were looking for an investor and um, he asked me if I'd be interested. So, and, and of course I was. I'm always curious about new opportunities and especially technology. And so uh, I got introduced to the, this individual. Turned out that he had been the former uh, chief technology officer for Railvac, and he had left Railvac to start his own, co own company. This was back in the, um, in, the, in the mid to late 90s time frame, so it was a while, while ago. And uh, when I looked at his technology, he was actually developing um, solid state uh, polymer, lithium polymer batteries, lithium ion polymer batteries. And, um, so I, I guess my intent was to be a little bit different kind of investor who knew a little bit about the technology and could actually roll my sleeves up and get involved and actually had some ideas and one thing led to another. We actually um, put together a relationship. Uh, but as I got into it I, and I looked around, I realized that the battery industry overall was looking at lithium polymer batteries and that was the emerging technology at the time. And I was a little bit concerned that if I stayed focused on that, that I could find myself a, a Me Too player in, in a very crowded field. And um, so what I uh, decided to do was to look beyond lithium polymer for the next generation of battery because I felt that a small startup company, the uh, one advantage that we could have is to be able to come up with some real, really innovative technology and then uh, get some intellectual property in place and then um, have that available uh, for the industry once it got to the point where it realized uh, where things needed to go. So I started uh, developing solid state ceramic uh, batteries using a glass electrolyte as opposed to liquid electrolyte. And there's several advantages of this. One of them is that um, the liquid, uh, I mean, sorry, the glass electrolyte can operate at much higher temperatures which solves a major problem in the auto industry because one of the big deals here in, in, with automobile batteries is that when they get to in the range of t 60 degrees centigrade, you started seeing degraded performance, degraded cycle life, and so a lot of the electric vehicles actually have advanced and very sophisticated cooling systems just to keep the batteries from going out of, out of spec in terms of their temperature. And so the idea of a battery that's more robust and could handle more harsh environments um, to solve a major uh, cost driver for cars and actually eliminate the weight uh, for that additional cooling and, 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 and flow loops, water and radiator and all of those things that uh, are associated with it. Uh, so uh, the ceramic battery offers um, a number of advantages. The other one that's very significant is that we can use a lithium metal anode because there's no um, liquid electrolyte uh, in, in the system to react with the lithium and create a passivation coating, which you know, technology-wise, it's, it's a real uh, problem in, in lithium and uh, lithium-ion batteries. So we're able to use um, lithium metal, and um, we're also able to make much denser uh, cathodes. All of that equates to a battery uh, that has the possibility of achieving as much as three times the energy of a lithium-ion battery in the same size package. The, the R&D process itself uh, is, uh, is, is not for everybody. Everybody doesn't have the stomach for it or the patience. Um, there are a number of ways of describing it, but you know, let me just kind of start with this uh, solid state battery. When we got it and got, we, we found this technology at Oak Ridge, and they made these batteries by sputter deposition, which is a, um, a process that's used in the semiconductor industry, and it works in that industry because very small integrated circuits uh, you can sell for a, a high price. But a very small battery that doesn't store very much energy is going to have very limited applications, maybe circuit board mounted uh, uh, energy storage and things like that maybe. Uh, but the, the market is not as broad as it would be for a larger all solid state battery. Um, such as for cell phones, computers, and of course automobiles. So when we realized that the technology was um, 
and the way the batteries were being made was not suitable for making bigger batteries, uh, we launched a program to uh, uh, make uh, solid state batteries using more conventional ceramic processing techniques. Um, I say conventional ceramic processing techniques, but it turns out that the techniques that we're employing are, are a little bit more sophisticated than just you know, a green tape casting of pottery ceramic and sticking it in an oven to fire it. Um, it's a little bit more involved than that. Um, but uh, the research process itself is like, the best way to describe it is like peeling an onion. You, you, you're looking at the problem that you need to solve and you peel and once you solve that you get to peel that layer back but then you, that's when you get to see what the next layer is. And so it's you know, peeling the onion to one layer and one problem after another and, and you have to turn over all the rocks if you will or, and look at the layers at all different angles to uh, identify the optimum solution at that point. Um, the um, uh, solution at that point that gets you to the next layer Sometimes it's not compatible with the solution to the next, that layer that's following, so you got to go back and get something that's compatible between the two that allows you to continue to move the technology forward. So there is a lot of um, uh, false starts, um, a lot of um, problem solving, a lot of unknowns that you have to figure out how to address. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that's probably most um, challenging uh, is the development of a new type of material, which is one of the things that we had to do to achieve the success. We have materials that we've developed here that nobody else has and doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Uh, we have developed ways of applying those materials and implementing them in the battery that um, nobody else knows about at this point. Um, so coming up with a new material and being able to implement that in the battery as a way of solving that layer of the onion so you can get to the next layer uh, is the process and it's, it is very challenging and sometimes very slow and tedious and it's pretty easy to run out of patience. I mentioned pro pottery processing for example. Um, in the battery um, we literally take the uh, cathode material and it's the same for the solid state battery it's the same cathode material that's used uh, in a conventional lithium ion battery it's, and we're able to use some of the more advanced, advanced higher performance materials for example uh, our glass electrolyte can uh, we, we've tested it at voltages as high as 10 volts so um, some of the more exotic materials that are not um, um, uh, compatible with existing liquid electrolytes so they can't be used in batteries we can use those uh, because we can operate at the higher voltages that these materials require. So we are able to extract the performance uh, at that level. Um, we, we do a couple things. We have a couple of approaches. We can actually take the cathode material and center it and then infuse it with the glass electrolyte. Or we can use the glass electrolyte precursor, if you will, as a uh, casting slurry. And we uh, cast the material and then we take that uh, casting through a process that converts that precursor into actual glass. So the glass electrolyte functions as a binder to hold the uh, cathode structure together. Uh, after that, we're able to coat another layer of glass on top of there to act as a separator, and then the lithium goes on top of that separator. What we were trying to do is develop a battery that um, uh, could store more energy than a conventional lithium ion battery and it also be able to handle and operate in, in more harsh and challenging environments. Um, I mentioned that um, uh, conventional batteries, lithium ion batteries, when you get above or in the range of 60 degrees centigrade, as you charge and discharge them, the cycle life or the number of times you can charge and discharge them starts to really degrade. And so you know, there are a lot of effort that goes into keeping those battery temperatures low. On a hot day in your automobile driving down the highway, the pavement can be well above 60 degrees centigrade, and that's pretty, you can imagine how challenging it would be to keep the batteries cool in that kind of condition. The other really advantage, uh, advantage in this technology is energy density, how, and specific energy. Uh, that's how much energy, I like, uh, how much energy you can uh, store um, inside a certain volume and, or within a certain weight battery. Uh, so for a given size battery, we, this technology offers up to three times the energy storage capability in comparison to a convention, conventional lithium-ion battery. 
over the next 16, 18 months, um, uh, to some extent what we will be starting to uh, produce will depend on the customers, the customers' uh, desires and needs, and of course the support that we're getting uh, from those customers financially. Our strategy has been to um, develop strategic relationships as opposed to uh, pure venture capital type funding. Um, for the most part, what we're, uh, the, the, the most straightforward thing for us to do right now is to provide batteries that can operate, operate in these harsh thermal environments. Uh, for example, I mentioned the, the limitations of conventional lithium ion batteries being in the range of about 60 degrees centigrade. We have batteries that we routinely operate in the range of 150 degrees centigrade, and they're, they actually like it better up there. Um, so there are a lot of applications where that um, technology will be suitable. One attractive application would be in the oil well industry for downhole drilling where you have sensors down the, the well hole and you want to know what um, the conditions are. Those environments are too harsh for conventional batteries, but this technology would be um, very suitable for that. Uh, there are other applications as well uh, that where the high temperature capability would be very attractive. I will venture to say that you know, we're not three times the energy of conventional lithium ion batteries yet, but we're somewhere in the range of one and a half to two. So, um, you know, we've, we've, we've accomplished a lot so far, and um, that progress I expect to continue. There are actually, actually two battery technologies that we're developing. The ceramic battery is one of them. That's the all solid state with glass electrolyte instead of liquid. The other area which is um, like the next generation beyond that is lithium air battery. Um, we uh, started working on lithium air batteries back in 2003-2004 time frame. Lately there's been a lot more hype about lithium air and you know, a number of larger companies, IBM for one, has gotten um, uh, interested in it and has been you know, really, really promoting and pushing for more research in that area. Um, but we uh, uh, as part of our strategy of looking beyond where the state of the art was, uh, we started working on lithium air batteries back you know, in 2000 and we've maintained a pretty stable and steady uh, focus on the technology uh, in, that, in that time frame and from then to now. Um, we've developed uh, a number of um, um, proprietary technologies that will help enable that technology to be viable and practical. We have a new type of separator system uh, taking advantage of our glass electrolyte as well as a, uh, some other um, separator, polymer separator materials uh, that um, again are proprietary to us that um, allows us to better protect the lithium anode. And the challenge for lithium air, one of the major challenges, there are a number of, a number of them, but for the lithium anode, where you want to um, breathe ambient air or operate on ambient air. So it's more like a fuel cell in the sense that you have this battery, but to discharge it, you're going to take oxygen from the ambient air and react the lithium with that oxygen to, to produce the electricity. Um, but lithium spontaneously reacts with oxygen and even moisture in ambient air, so you need to have it protected so that um, those reactions don't happen without making electricity. So we developed um, separator systems, and I say that because it's a combination of materials that allow us to protect the lithium, but yet the separator will conduct um, lithium ions through to the uh, cathode side for reaction with oxygen. So that's um, a key focus. Another area we focused on is the cathode itself and um, maximizing the uh, amount of um, energy capacity or discharge reaction product that you can get from this cathode. And another challenge, challenging, challenging area that we've addressed is the um, discharge rate capability because one of the things that researchers have acknowledged and understood about lithium air is that the rate that you can discharge them uh, is, is limited. It's, it's not limited, and most people hadn't thought about this, but it's really not limited by the availability of oxygen because if you look at a fuel cell, for example, where you have the same situation where you're operating on ambient air, you can get hundreds of milliamp hours, milliamps I'm sorry, per square centimeter in terms of current. And lithium air traditionally has been in the 1,000 times less current per square centimeter. So we've increased that um, 
by a oh, factor of about 10 to 100. So we're in the milliamp range in terms of discharge rate capability over the um, uh, work that um, uh, other people have done. So uh, our energy density per square centimeter, our rate capability per square centimeter is um, at a level where um, it's starting, starting to look a lot more practical. So our focus is one of the areas that remains somewhat of a challenge is the electrolyte itself uh, that's going to go in the air cathode side because there, there are a couple of things that um, need to happen there. Uh, you, one, you need an electrolyte that's not going to dry out. So when you expose this uh, battery to ambient air because you're operating on ambient air, you want the electrolyte to be have very low volatility, i.e. you don't want it to evaporate and dry out. Um, not at any unreasonable rate anyway. I mean, you have to periodically um, put fluid in your radiator in your car or you know, things like that. You know, that kind of replenishment could be practical, but you don't want to have wholesale dry out on a you know, regular basis that causes a, a maintenance headache or, or a pain to stop and have to uh, constantly um, refill. So the non-volatile electrolyte that's stable with the lithium reaction products and things like that, that's an area that um, a number of researchers are, are focused on. And so what we, part of our strategy up until now in a way has been to develop the battery system using um, some electrolytes that we had developed in-house, but the more sophisticated lab, uh, electrolytes um, will come from uh, some of the work that's being done in some of the national laboratories like Argonne, uh, for example, that's where they've done some work. In fact, uh, we went to Argonne a few years ago um, to um, test some of the electrolytes that they had developed because I had seen some performance uh, parameters that suggested that it would work well in our battery in the lithium air cell. And the individual there that I ended up working with had not been involved with lithium air batteries and, and this was kind of a new thing. But he got all excited and uh, after, after he got the test results and now Argonne is touted with having the largest lithium air battery research program in the country. Well, that had its genesis, genesis with, with our work. Uh, something to feel good about. Um, the, um, so, so the electrolyte itself, uh, we're now starting to initiate our own internal program for the electrolytes because um, um, you know, the rest of the system is uh, pretty much coming together, so it's time for that part of the a layer of the onion, if you will, to be addressed. And if someone else does not have a solution, then we'll have to have our own. I have invented, invented an engine, I, and it's called the JTEC. Uh, it's, um, it's a thermoelectrochemical converter. It's the way I like to refer to it. That's what tech stands for, anyway. Um, the way engines work, all engines, if you think about them, um, steam engines, internal combustion engines, all of them, They'll compress working fluid at low temperature, like pulling air into your car, in your carburetor, the piston comes up and compresses it, or even in a steam plant where you have a, a, a pump that pressurizes water and sends that water, pressurized water to the uh, boiler where you heat it up and convert it to steam. Then the internal combustion engine, that compressed air, you inject fuel and burn that fuel to heat the air up. And when you make it hot, the expansion uh, creates a lot more energy than it took to uh, compress it. So the difference in what it takes to compress versus what you get when you expand is the work that the engine does, and that's the output. Um, what's different about my engine is that I don't use mechanical moving parts to do the compression and expansion. I use membrane electrode assemblies, similar to what's in a fuel cell, to compress hydrogen at low temperature, then heat it up, in a different stack and expand it at high temperature so that uh, I get more work out in the high temperature expansion than it takes to compress it at low temperature. So it's an engine that has no moving mechanical parts. It um, operates on what's called the uh, Erickson thermodynamic cycle. Uh, uh, and um, the Erickson cycle is equivalent, theoretically equivalent to the Kano cycle, so less real world uh, losses because no device is going to be without friction. Uh, but the theoretical cycle is more efficient than uh, the other cycles that other engines operate on. For example, the steam engine is the uh, Rankine cycle. Uh, the Ericsson cycle is more efficient. The theoretical Ericsson is more efficient than the theoretical Rankine. Uh, the auto cycle, which is what uh, uh, in 
internal combustion engines operate on, again, the theoretical efficiency there is less than the uh, Carnot or Ericsson theoretical efficiency. So we're operating on a theoretically higher efficiency cycle, so you know, all things, all else being equal, our performance should be significantly better. Uh, and this engine could be used for converting heat from any source in directly into uh, electricity. So solar energy, heat from the sun, uh, waste heat from factories and other industrial processes, um, uh, waste heat from even other types of engines um, could be converted by this in, in engine into electricity. Well, I've been an, uh, a, a tinkerer since way back when, when I was a small kid. Uh, I've worked on some of the um, most advanced systems back in, at the time when I was working professionally, some of the most advanced systems that the, this country was developing. I worked on the B-2 bomber, did orbit insertion analysis for the shuttle, um, have an invention on the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, while I worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for a while and worked on Mars Observer and all of those systems. And I was tinkering and inventing uh, on the side at home at night in my spare time, and it was more of a, an interest or a hobby. Um, but then I got to a point where I was ready to strike out on my own, and um, that seemed like a very exciting, attractive way to go. Uh, the success of the water gun, a super soaker, uh, made it possible for me to really leave and become a full-time professional inventor. Um, so in, in that sense, it's like I'm pursuing my dream. So the success of the Super Soul, though, and, and, and what that meant was that, okay, I started to look at my circumstance and, and realize that, okay, uh, there is, um, I've been very fortunate. So what do you do with that? And um, given the um, gifts and blessings, I have to call them that, what responsible things should I do with them? <laughs> you know? And so I've um, pretty much uh, committed to um, uh, addressing some tough problems, things that I felt needed to be addressed. I'm saying that because uh, that it, the, the Super Soaker gave me the opportunity to do it, but in reality, I was actually working on those kind of problems when I got the idea for the water gun for the Super Soaker. I was actually trying to come up with a new type of heat pump that would not use Freon uh, as a working fluid. And um, when I was working on that, I got the idea for the water gun and did the water gun with the idea of going back to the more challenging science uh, technology um, after that was success and I had the revenue to pursue it. The conclusion I come to is that energy um, is probably one of the most important challenges facing mankind at this point. And so I decided to to use my talents to try and address some of those problems. Um, the, um, I think you know energy is what makes everything go. You know, it's um, what we've used. In fact, fire is what, use of fire, the earliest form of energy that man um, was managed to man managed to take control of and actually use for his own purposes was fire. And of course, that made a huge difference in the quality of life. And that process has not ended to this day. So energy um, is a key to improving quality of life. The other thing is, you know, I spent some time in the military and uh, understanding uh, and uh, the uh, impact that uh, availability of limited energy resources can have on the ability of nations to get along and, and the bickering that would evolve over Dwindling, dwindling energy resources could be uh, pretty significant. And I uh, felt that that was something that you know, I could spend my energies at helping to address. Um, it seems a bit um, um, audacious, I guess, to think that one could take on such challenging problems, but one has to spend one's life doing something. <laughs> um, so I decided to you know, try to do something worthwhile.